going to, this morning, answer a question. It's a question that actually I was given a little while back and uh, wanted to spend a little bit of time preparing a lesson for it uh, to answer it. And so I, I thought I would just preach on that particular question. And the question is, can we understand the Bible alike? And I think there is, obviously, when you look out in the religious world, there's much religious... Uh, confusion. There's a lot of people that will say, you know, well, this is my interpretation. You have your interpretation. You have your truth. I have my truth. And on and on, you know, this, this round robin idea of, well, uh, there is no absolute truth is, is being perpetuated. And so we want to ask and answer the question, can we understand the Bible alike? And I believe it's the case that we can and should understand the Bible alike. One of the great writers, several centuries back, uh, Locke, wrote this. He says, The Bible is one of the greatest blessings bestowed by God on the children of mankind. He says, It it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture for its matter. It is pure. It is all sincere. Nothing too much and nothing wanting. And that's a great summary concerning Scripture. Daniel Webster, the one we know for uh, the collection of definitions, as we know uh, we have uh, Webster's Dictionary. Daniel Webster wrote, I believe that the Bible is to be understood, received in the plain and obvious meaning of its passages. I cannot persuade myself that a book intended for the instruction and and conversion of the whole world should cover its true meaning in any such mystery and doubt that none but critics and philosophers could possibly discover it. And so I also would add to that sentiment. Uh, So this morning, will you at least consider with me in the text that we've read, but also in some others that I want to add to this particular study, I want to use this as a foundation, if you will, to uh, build a, a tower, if you will, of sincere reasons why we can, in fact, know and understand the Bible alike and that we should do so. It is pressing for us to do so. It is pertinent for our salvation to do so. We have this passage, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I have the scripture reading back up a few verses, back to verse 14, because it it shows for us this idea. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, as we know, he says, You continue, Timothy, the things that you have learned, the things that you have been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, who did he learn these things through? He says, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. That's important. From a child, he has known the Holy Scriptures. In other words, we might imply from this that even a child can understand the Bible and should have that opportunity. Parents, we need to be teaching our young people the Scriptures because they can certainly understood, understand it. He says, you have known from a child the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise, they give wisdom. This is wisdom from above, wisdom from God. The same kind of wisdom, if you will, that Solomon, the wise man, asked for. God gave him an abundance that was greater than anybody else. And in so doing, he was greatly blessed. But the point is that we, too, can have that wisdom from above. And know those things. And yes, understand them. We'll continue to build on this idea. But then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. One of the things that you have to uh, think about with me, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he writes to Timothy as a son in the faith, one whom he has himself taught, one whom he has also laid hands upon. And those gifts, if you will, of the Holy Spirit have been conferred upon him. And so he has the ability, he has a miraculous knowledge to be able to teach those things. And so he would be sent to Ephesus. He would go along with Paul on some of the journeys that Paul would go with. He would leave him in a location, expect that he would show up in another particular location. And his whole uh, point was he was given opportunity to teach and to instruct. 
And so when we get to verse 16, this is a reminder for Timothy, all Scripture is inspired of God, literally the breath of God. It's God-breathed. And he said it's profitable for doctrine, for teaching. Timothy, this is what you're going to need to be able to go and to teach others. All Scripture is given for that very purpose. He says for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Everything that a man needs to be complete, he says in verse 17. Thoroughly furnished unto every good work. But I want you to notice with me, let's read on into the next chapter. Because he continues, he says, I charge you. So, Timothy, because of all this, you've known the Scripture from the time you were a youth. You've been trained in the Scripture by both your mother and your grandmother. You have been taught the Scriptures. You've been with me. So you understand those things that you've been assured of, that you've been with me, you've heard. He says, you're going to teach those things. The inspiration of God, he says, all Scripture is made for that very reason. So I'm charging you, Timothy, I'm giving you a charge before God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Do what? Timothy, you go and you preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. That's when they want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it, as the old preachers might say. Rebuke, or reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering, enduring and teaching. It keeps coming back to this idea. Right here in this one passage, we could, we've really answered the question, can we understand the Bible like? Because by its very implication, Paul says, you go and you preach the Word. And it is sufficient. It is all sufficient for everything that you're going to need to be able to teach others, to be able to reprove others to get them on the right path, to be able to correct them, to show them the right way, what is righteous before God. You're going to need to know those things. So I'm charging you then before God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, you go and you preach the word and you do it even if they don't want to hear it. Why? Because there's an implication and an expectation here that the truth is going to be taught. That same truth that you've known from the time that you were a youth That same truth, he says, Timothy, there's going to come a time, he says, when he says they're not going to endure sound doctrine. That's what you're going to be teaching, healthy doctrine, sound doctrine. But they're not going to want to hear it. And so after their own desires and lusts, they're going to heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They're going to have an opportunity to hear the truth. There's going to come a time when they're not going to, some of them are not going to want to hear it. You keep preaching it. You continue to preach it. That's the charge that Timothy was given here. So we could ask the question this way. Can we see the Bible alike? If you define the word see, it literally means to perceive the meaning of something able to see it as it is, to perceive the meaning of it, or literally to understand or to come to know what the Bible, and I would say both Old and New Testaments, have to say alike. (laughs) We can do so alike. There's an expectation in this. This text affirms that very thing, that we can understand and see the Bible alike, but I want us to continue on this journey. I, 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 want, to see, I want to see that this is not uh, just one text that I could pull out and, and begin to show you. I, I want to show you that this is God's plan. So let's think about the Old Testament for just a moment. In Romans 15 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, whatever things were written before, the King James says aforetime, he says, those things that were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Those things written before, he's referring to Scripture. These things written before, those things that Peter would also mention. Knowing this first, he would say that that no prophecy of Scripture, he says, is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man. That's what we need to differentiate. That's what we have to understand the difference here. 
We're not talking about some man-made writing, something that man has come up with. We're talking about divine revelation from heaven, divine knowledge, a higher knowledge. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and following. That higher knowledge. He says, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. Now think about that for just a moment. Paul says the things that were written before were written for our learning. There's an implication, there's an expectation in that, isn't there? That we would learn then from those things that were written before. And, and Peter says that there's no private interpretation. Why? Because he says, because it didn't come by man, it came by God. And that's 2 Peter 1, verse 20 through 21. And so those things spoken of in old time, written for our learning... The implication is very simple. We must understand it alike in order to learn from it. The second part of this, let's, let's think about an example here. Let's think about Nehemiah for just a moment. You have Nehemiah in the time of Ezra as well. Nehemiah chapter 8. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we go back and we find this is the time of the rebuilding. People are being brought back together. In fact, it says in Nehemiah 8 and verse 1 that all the people were gathered together as one man. So we're talking about a people that have been scattered. Now they're brought back. They have been building. They have been working together. And now they're going to receive the word of God. And so they've been gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe, bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And verse 2 says, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of God. <clears throat> Men and women who were there, they could all hear, and it says, with understanding. One people gathered. Tens of thousands of people gathered. As one man, it says. What they do? When they heard the reading of Scripture, they understood it. Isn't that amazing? They understood it. Well, where were the critics? Well, I'm sure there were some, but they understood it. Nonetheless, that which the Lord had commanded Israel, it says, Ezra, before the assembly of men and women... All who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month, he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. He, ran, he read it for a long time. <laughs> he went longer than just that 30-minute sermon, okay? He spent some time reading the law of God before the people. Morning until midday. Before the men and women, he says, and those who could understand... All the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. That begins to tell us something as well. They were paying attention to what it said. When you start asking the question, well, how is it then that people have their own interpretation? or How is it that they, they claim that they believe it to say something else? They're not paying attention to it. That's what happens. They were attentive to the book of the law. If you drop down to verse 8 in Nehemiah 8, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. They gave the sense and they helped them to understand the reading. And so, in other words, they read aloud the scripture. And then guess what he did? He preached it. He preached it in their hearing. and applied it to them. And they understood it. We, we can see that from the next chapters and the, the changes that would take place. Those things that were necessary for them to change as they're hearing the word of God and realizing, number one, they had gone off into captivity because of sin. 
And now they're standing before God being judged by the book of the law of God once again because of their sin and there's changes that need to take place. Ezra read it, he preached it, and he applied it for them to be able to understand it. And they could do so alike. Seems incredible to me, and it might to you as well, that God with infinite wisdom who can understand man's thoughts afar off would present to mankind Scripture, the Bible, that cannot be understood alike by all. So the obvious fact is Scripture is profitable for teaching. This is what Paul is writing to Timothy, right? Scripture is profitable. It's good for doctrine, teaching, and instructing the men of God who are willing to approach it for study with an open heart, who would listen to it, it will make changes in their lives. That's what we see with Nehemiah and Israel. Let's look at another example. Let's come to the New Testament. Let's think about the Sadducees. You know, they're sad, you see, as we've been singing over the summer, right? The Sadducees. Here's what's interesting. Let's let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. This is an interesting case study, but let's begin at verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there's no resurrection. Now keep that in mind. This is what they say. They say there's no resurrection. And they ask him, saying, Master, just reference to teacher. Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, it says, when he had married a wife, deceased, having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third all the way unto the seventh. So they're proposing to him something that they believe, okay, number one, let's just, we're going to confuse the matter, okay? We're going to make it just ridiculous to begin with. But remember what they say. They say there's no resurrection. That's their belief. That's what they're going about teaching and saying to everyone. And so they present this, Ridiculous thing. Yeah, and that's and Moses, by the way, this was part of that leveret law that was given under the, the law of Moses. A man who had married a wife, if he passed away not having any children, then the brother, the next in line, would raise up children with that woman for that namesake, if you will, of his brother. Now they get to a situation where this has happened and we're beyond seven men who have died and this is yet to be fulfilled. And so here's the situation. So watch what they ask. He says, all the way unto the seventh. Verse 27, the last of all the women, and last of all, the woman died also. Verse 28, therefore in the resurrection. What do they say? They say there's no resurrection. But Jesus, in the resurrection... Whose wife shall she be of the seven? They have all had her as a wife, not having fulfilled that lover law, but nonetheless, they have all had her as a wife at this point. Whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? And watch Jesus' answer, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You do her. <laughs> you are wrong. Why? Not knowing the Scriptures. You don't know your Bible. Therefore, you are wrong. Nor do you know the power of God. Guess what? Had they known the Scripture, guess what they would know about? They'd know about the power of God, wouldn't they? This would not be an issue for them. In the resurrection, he goes on to say, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
but are as the angels of God. It doesn't say, that, by the way, that they are angels of God. It says they are as angels of God and that they neither marry nor are given in marriage. That's the point that's made in this passage. But, he says, verse 31, touching the resurrection of the dead, being this is what you say, being you brought it up, being you've tried to confuse me and trick me and to do all of this, let me go ahead and answer what the real question is here. He says, have you not read that he, that, that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And that probably puzzled them for a moment. But watch what he says. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Their whole premise. So understand what they're doing here. Christ, his answers silence them. And the word know that's used there in that passage literally means, get this, to perceive directly, to have an understanding of. To see it as it is. To see it as it is truth. There was an expectation that if they'd known the scripture, they would perceive the truth. They would know the truth. They would have an understanding of the truth. Guess what? They would have an understanding of the truth alike. But they didn't. Jesus knew that the Sadducees, that they could see the Scriptures just alike if they would read. Guess what they were doing, though? They were saying. Somewhere along the way, they skipped the reading part, and they were just saying things. And to prove their point, this is what they're saying. There's no resurrection. So guess what they do? They just start asking questions. Does that sound like modern day critic today? When you ask someone who has all these ideas that there are, there are these discrepancies and, and, and things that are contrary to one another in the Scripture, well, have you, will you show me one of those? Well, I don't know where they are right now. Really? But you say this, and your question to me is this. This is what the Sadducees were doing. They were saying one thing. They've not been reading. They do not know. And so then they question. They're just a modern-day critic is all they were here. And Jesus pointed out that what they had missed by saying instead of reading was truth. Let's think about the New Testament. We, we compared some things from the Old Testament, and, and, and we've looked at the Sadducees, we looked at the time of Nehemiah. Let's think about the New Testament. How, what, is, what is the point being made by the New Testament? Do, can we find this, this idea being taught in Scripture? You have the Apostle Paul, he's a follower of Christ, obviously a, men, a member of the body of Christ, served God in preaching the gospel as, uh, as a minister of the gospel unto the Gentiles, an able minister of the New Testament. He is inspired of God. He is an inspired apostle of God. We know this, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, and verse 1. He, he would say, be followers of me as I am of Christ. So we know he's a follower of God. We know that he knows the scripture. And it's interesting because in Romans chapter 16, he would close out that letter to the church at Rome, to those Christians who were in Rome, he says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, in other words, what I'm preaching, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret from the world. He didn't say, I came up with this on my own. This is fascinating. This is good stuff. You think that he stood on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17? He says, look at what I've come up with. Now that's what they wanted to question him about. What is it that this... This seed picker, this babbler, what is it that he is, is trying to interject here? What is it that he's trying to, to show us, this new doctrine? So he's, no, this is from God. I didn't make this up. This is from above. This came by way of revelation directly from God. 
the revelation of the mystery kept secret from the world, or it says when the world, uh, from the world, when the world began. He says, but now has been made known, been made manifest, and by prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for, here's the purpose, here's why, for obedience to the faith. Tell me why would an all-knowing God give to mankind, all of mankind, the scriptures if they cannot understand it alike and then say, you've got to obey me. It is because there are those who are saying, oh, you serve a vengeful God, and look how He is. Look how vengeful He is. Look at the world today in, in which we live. How would He allow those things to go on? How could He, how could he let these things happen? And, and He's going to send, send good people to hell. How, how, would you serve, how could you possibly serve a God like that? No, God has given His Word and an expectation that we would understand it alike and obey it and be saved. Notice in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul again writing here, he says, all of these things, talks about that revelation again, the mystery, all those things. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus, he said, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given to me towards you, how that by revelation, he says, he made known unto me the mystery, these things that were a mystery since the beginning of time. He says, I, I wrote these things previously in another letter. He says, so whereby when you read what I've written, you may understand my knowledge in that mystery. Those things that have been once hidden, that God has revealed unto me as one of His apostles, divinely inspired by the Spirit to know these things, to have all truth, to be guided into all truth, to be given remembrance of those things, and to preach those things to all mankind with an expectation that you would know and obey. He says, I wrote these things, I wrote a few words so that when you read, you may understand my knowledge. In other words, what I know, what's been revealed to me about this mystery. And he goes on to explain what this mystery ultimately is. Let's, let's look at another concept here. You have the perfect law of liberty. James would mention this. James chapter 1, uh, 21 through 25, it says, lay, lay aside all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, Receive with meekness, he says, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Receive with meekness. He says, but don't, don't stop there. Don't stop there. You need to be a doer of the word. Look at the expectation. God has given his word, his engrafted, his implanted word. It's able to save your soul. You receive it with meekness, and then you go and do something with it. And the implication is, I've got to understand it, right? I've got to know and perceive the truth of it, what it is that God wants me to do. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone's a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man uh, observing his natural face in the mirror. He observes himself, and he goes away, and he begins to forget immediately what kind of man he truly is. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. The word perfect, again, means complete. He didn't leave it lacking in any way. That was the point that Webster had made. It's not lacking. Or rather, Locke made that point. James 2, the next chapter, he says this, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Verse 12. Again, an expectation. And an implication, we must know it. Think about the, the perpetuity of teaching. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit those to faithful men who will also teach others. The whole point is it's, it's 
this bulk of truth that we have, it's made to be taught generation after generation after generation to those who will be faithful to it. Think about John writing to the seven churches of Asia. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. What if he just stopped there? Well, I heard it. I audibly heard the preacher say it. That's fine. That's enough for me, right? No, then he says, and keep those things. Keep them. Those things that are written, he says. He would end the book similarly. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. This is chapter 22, verse 17. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Again, talking about the right kind of attitude that we are received with meekness, the implanted word he says, James does. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. I testify everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from that holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Is there any doubt that we have to know and understand? And no private interpretation here. Didn't come by man, came by God. And therefore we must know it alike. That's the implication here. We could talk about God's Universal system here. The provisions that God has made for mankind, for the whole world, emphasizes this idea of an understanding. The gospel is for every creature, for all mankind. We think about Mark 16, verse 50. Go and preach the gospel unto every creature. All creation, in other words. The gospel is for every creature. The church for all people. And the judgment for all nations. And if that's truly the case, remember Isaiah, Isaiah 2, verse 2, talking about the coming kingdom, the coming church. It shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. The church for all people. It doesn't end there. The judgment. All men everywhere are commanded to repent, Acts 17, verse 30 and 31, because a day has been appointed for judgment. Jesus is that judge, and before him shall all nations be gathered. That picture is given in Matthew chapter 25, verse 32. The words spoken by Jesus shall judge all of mankind in that last day, John 12 and verse 48. Why would an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God, Give to all mankind His Word and just say, do what you want with it. You have my truth. That's what He says to mankind. You have my truth. Not your truth. Not their truth. You have my truth. understand it, and obey it. You could talk about why people might misunderstand such things. You could list things like apathy. And there's some people who just don't care. They don't want to see the truth. They don't care anything about it. There, there are those blinded minds, blind leaders, false leaders, false teachers, false doctrines that are out there. A, a religious frame of reference for some people is enough to keep them from seeing the truth. The traditions, the way that they were raised up, family things, all of those things might be something that, that might keep somebody, that might be a hindrance for some people. But not for the individual who wants salvation. Not for the individual who wants to be found pleasing before God. And the universal idea that division itself is wrong. Not math. That's not what we're talking about here. But the idea of dividing. It's contrary to the teaching of Jesus. It's contrary to the prayer of Jesus. John 17, 20 and 21. Division is something that is worldly-minded, carnal-minded. 
Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 1 through 4. In Romans 8 and 6, he says this, For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the difference. It doesn't matter what the hindrance may be. We've got to get beyond those things and into God's Word and know it. In other words, perceive the very truth to be able to see it as it is. Because God's expecting us to do that. The universal idea of division, division hinders growth. You have that picture in Ephesians 2 talking about the building fitly framed together. It grows up into an holy temple of the Lord. Ephesians 2 verse 21. And yet division would hinder that growth. Division contrary to the very prayer of Christ. I'm not praying for these alone, talking about the apostles, but I'm praying for all those who would believe on their teaching, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And division itself is condemned. So we have these universal truths that also show us the very idea that the world would be a mess, an, an indescribable mess, maybe you say it is, But think about how worse it would be if if we couldn't understand our calendars the same way, alike. If we didn't understand traffic lights, alike, and exactly what they mean. Mathematics? How about the clock on the wall that's telling me it's, it's time to wrap it up? If we didn't understand those things alike then it might be one of those Ezra sermons. What about our telephone numbers? Here's a universal truth for you. But what if we don't understand them alike? I'm trying to get in touch with Cindy. I know her number, but I have to say, you know, I'm just going to add a couple other digits in there. I don't know who's picking up on the other line, but it's not Cindy. You get that. We understand that. Those universal truths that are there, we understand. How about an all-knowing, infinitely wise God who has given us His Word to save us? Why can't we understand it alike? Is it because of those hindrances? Those things that are standing in the way for us? Remember, the wisdom of man is foolishness before God Almighty. And yet mankind has come up with things that we see alike on a daily basis. And He has given us a book that we can know alike, understand alike, and see alike, if we will simply open our eyes, resist the devil, hear with our ears, reject all obstructions, lay aside our thoughts, be converted, and God will heal us. That's the message that you find in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. Throughout Scripture, God wants to heal us. The problem is sin. And He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. Why think that we couldn't possibly understand that message and what He wants us to do with that information? How He wants us to be obedient to those things. He says, believe me, that I am the Son of God. Repent of sin. Confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Be baptized to wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts twenty two sixteen. This is what our Lord has taught and divinely revealed to His apostles to preach. And those very same things we are taught to preach. As disciples, Eddie's lesson last Wednesday evening reminding us that Great Commission. The Great Commission doesn't make any sense unless we can understand God's Word. But knowing that we can, we then have a responsibility in it to obey it first ourselves and then to teach it to others. And just as Paul told Timothy, the things that you've heard from me Commit them to faithful men who will teach others as well. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. I'll leave you with this. 
Jesus very simply said, The truth shall make you free. The truth. We can know and understand and see it alike. The question is, will we? And do we? If we might be able to help you in some way this morning, we would be encouraged to pray for you, to help you, to stand beside you in a time of need. Maybe you're one who needs to obey the gospel this morning and we stand ready to help you with that. Or maybe you're ready to, to, to take that, that next step and, and maybe just studying God's word. Maybe you want to know more about what God expects, more about that truth. We would be honored if you'd give us that opportunity to study. And so if any of those things that we've talked about this morning, if they, if they are confusing, if they've caused you to have questions, maybe to question your past, some of the things that you've believed, or some of the things that you've been doing, then let us help. And let us encourage you this morning. We're going to stand and sing this invitation song and let us know how we might help. So you can come to the front now.